All right, Trinity Church, how are you doing today? It's great to see you. It is great to be inside when it's hot outside. So we're glad that you're here and grateful to get to be on this Sunday morning with you. My name is Todd Arnett. I'm the lead pastor here at Trinity Church. You join us today, just like you saw in a video, we're in a, a series looking at some of the different parables that Jesus taught. And I love that tagline. We're going to see it again today, that there are kingdom secrets hidden in plain sight. Jesus is constantly taking things that people could relate to, they could understand, and then he flips it and he says, but this means so much more when you consider, when you think of the kingdom that I came to bring. And so we're going to get to unpack that some more today. Before we do, I want to give an official welcome to those joining us on the pavilion. We are glad you are here today. And I want to make sure each and every one of you, before you leave today, if you didn't come through this direction, that you go out there and you notice every stump is gone out in our pavilion. We are grateful for that. That is good news. All the bad buckling concrete is gone out in the pavilion. We are grateful for that. It's been a big week. A lot of work has been going on. I, we took this picture this week to show you. You can kind of get a little bit of scale of what's going on out there. That equipment is kind of the length of a shovel. And so you'll note the root that's next to it. We talk a lot at church about being a people who are rooted and reaching. Not that kind. Okay, that's the, the bad kind of root. And it obviously is the explanation for why our concrete was doing what it's doing. But we're so grateful. When you look in there, you're seeing today a brand new um, uh, just kind of design and a lot of dirt. When you come back next week, shrubs, plants, all that's going in, and we're so excited for it. So we're just having a great space, and the folks in the pavilion, you're enjoying it today. You'll enjoy it more even next week. But we're really grateful for a lot of strides in a very short amount of time. Thank you for being patient. When I say short amount of time, you're like, Todd, it's been a long time. I know but a short amount of time this week for a lot of change, and we're grateful for that. So thanks for being patient with us along the way. If you have a Bible today, why don't you open it up? We're in the book of Matthew, very first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 13, if you want to find your way there. If you have um, a Trinity this week, you have notes inside of there as well. If you want to get those out, that'll help you track with us a little bit through our time together today. And that's what we want to do is be helpful to you on that front. Well, when we take a look at um, what we're looking at today in this parable, these parables, what they've done a great job of doing is they're helping us understand as, as citizens of this kingdom. I love in the book of Philippians, it talks about, you know, you're no longer citizens of this earth, but citizens of heaven. And so that's the kingdom that Jesus came to offer the nation of Israel when he came 2,000 years ago, and he kept talking about the kingdom of heaven. He was bringing it to them, but they didn't have a, a frame to understand it, so he kept using parables to help them understand. For us, on the other side of Jesus' ministry, on the other side of his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, now for us in the church, we are reading these parables through the lens of that's what it looks like to live in the kingdom. That's what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. We're going to see this with great clarity today as we dive in. Today we live in a world where making safe decisions is king. And it's like that for a lot of reasons. For some of us, we have this real just deep desire to have everything, quote, safe in our lives. And the more and more that we live, the more and more we realize nothing is safe. That's really an illusion, but even the idea of making safe or these decisions where nothing is really needing to be risked, we keep finding out that the reason why we think that way is because you've had some scams. You've had people pull the covers over your eyes. You've had people that have taken you and you've been frustrated. You, you responded to one of those emails of princes in Africa that needed your help. And you realize, man, people are just out to get me and some people think that's true of Jesus as well. And I want you to hear today in crystal clarity, number one, as we look at these parables, absolutely, Jesus is saying, I'm asking you to surrender all to follow me. Don't miss that. But the second thing is also true, what he has in store, the offer, the invitation he makes to you is absolutely worth it. And that's what we're going to dive into and look at today. Today, what we're also going to do, and I really want to draw your attention to this response of joy. I want you to see that the responses this today in these parables were never done out of compulsion, never out of I have to or kind of half-hearted. It was always with sheer joy that I get to respond, that I get to invest. And that's what I really want you to see. People, I've even done this as well. We use a lot of metaphors related to today about following Jesus. We'll often use like even the, the poker analogy of being all in. But today is really not one of that, it's not one of, of that kind of risk, it's really one of investment. 
of I'm going to take all that I have, and the interesting thing is I'm going to find out today it's a lot less valuable than I thought it was, and I'm actually going to put that in exchange for all that Jesus promises me, which is incredibly more valuable than I ever understood it to be. And that's the equation. That's what we're going to look at. I want to say from the very beginning today, I want you to look in the mirror. I want you to ask this question of yourself. If you're here today and you put your faith in Jesus, you would say, yes, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. Not, not just merely a name that you have, not because you live in America, but you said, yes, I have, I've responded to Jesus' invitation in the gospel and I follow him. Simple thing I want you to ask yourself throughout our time together in scripture today is has your investment been worth it? How is that going for you? That's a simple question. Can you resonate with the investors that we see today who would say, I'm all in. I invest fully what I have in order to gain what Jesus has done for me. Maybe you're here today and you haven't yet made that decision. You haven't made that investment. I'd really ask you to think and look in the mirror and consider two things. One would be, is this maybe a time when you're reconsidering? When you begin to say, maybe that's something I should take a harder look at. I should give more of an entrance in my life, this thing of Jesus and what he's done. Or are you satisfied with the decision you've made to so far not invest and simply think that what you're holding on to is really yours? And we'll find out today, the Bible's pretty clear that it's not. So let's dive in. Let's take a look. This is our now what statement. And let me say this, even before we look at that, you can look, it's on the screen. Experience the joy that's yours when you invest yourself fully into Jesus and his promises. I want to say from the beginning today, when we dive in, I'm going to spend a lot of time on point number one. Sometimes when I do that, people get really like, oh my word, we're going to be here till Thursday because he's going to go that long and the rest. I'm not. But we're going to spend a lot of time on point one and then points two and three will move a little quicker. Number one in your notes, kingdom seekers are joyfully ready to invest everything for what is to be gained. Kingdom seekers are joyfully ready to invest everything in for what is to be gained. You're in Matthew chapter 13, look at verse 44. The kingdom of heaven, this is Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Let's, look, let's begin with the context of this parable. You're in Matthew chapter 13. It has 58 verses. Watch this. All but six, 52 of the 58 verses in Matthew 13 are parables or the explanation of parables. So this is an incredible chapter that just is kind of one illustration after the next of Jesus taking ordinary things and connecting the dot to an extraordinary truth. Here's something that people could relate to in their everyday lives and Jesus helping them realize, but it means so much more when you understand what the kingdom of God is all about. So that's, that's the approach that he's taking. In the midst of all these illustrations of what the kingdom of God is like, Jesus talks about how one man may stumble onto treasure, we'll see that in a moment, and how another may go desperately searching for it, but at the end of the day, they both make the same decision. They both sell everything they have in order to purchase it. And that's, the, that's the, this idea of leveraging financial resources, leveraging all that they could get a hold of in order to buy these things. That's what we want to see today. I love, I've loved these parables for a long time. I'm really grateful to get to preach on them today. They've really meant something to me for a long time related to really what is, what is really about following Jesus. But I really want you to see something that I saw this week, and it's a part of the story that I think we seldom elevate in the way that it needs to. I'll, I'll give you that hint, and I'll come back to it in just a minute. Let's look at the first illustration, the first parable. These are sister parables, by the way. They absolutely belong together. They're not meant to be just understood apart from the other. But I think Jesus, I know Jesus has a great um, uh, purpose in why he shared them the way he did. In the first illustration, the meaning of the word found in the original language, New Testament was originally written in Greek, it has the connotation of to find by chance. So truly you could understand the person who finds this treasure in a field truly just stumbled upon it. He was not out um, kind of with a shovel and digging in different places, you know, going through people's yards and digging. He didn't have like a, um, a, a metal detector. He literally just walking through a field and maybe tripped on something or noticed the ground didn't look right and he began to look and that's what he found. Now you might struggle to consider how a pirate could be so dumb. 
When you think of buried treasure, that's all you and I ever think of are pirates, right? How could a pirate be so dumb as to put his treasure in a place that it could be easily found? But when I was doing some research and reading in one of my commentaries, Leon Morris said it this way. It's up on the screen. He said, in a day when places for keeping things safe that we take for granted, like that of a safe deposit box in a bank, when they didn't exist, people had to make their own arrangements. One method they employed was to bury their valuable possessions, and we'll see this next week, as, as did the unprofitable servant who hid his talent. He buried it in the ground. If anyone did this before going off on a journey and failed to return, the possessions remained there and might be found later through a chance discovery like that in this parable. So too, in frequent wars, people would hide valuables to keep them from looting soldiers, and sometimes the owners would not survive. So Morris just helps us understand, because some of you are like, hey, that's a thing. <laughs> I could go, I'm going to start going to all my neighbor's yards, you know, I'm going to find their stuff. Most likely not today in 2019, but in the first century, that's what would have been a way. If you had something valuable, you got to find ways to protect it because there's no bank you can just put it on storage with. So that's one of the things. So it either gone for a journey, never came back, or might have actually buried it so looting soldiers don't get it. As a result, they might get killed and now that treasure just sits. So that's a reasonable explanation for, and I think as Jesus' listeners were listening, they're like, yeah, we've heard stories of that happening before. So Jesus is going to talk about a guy who walks through a field, stumbles upon this amazing thing, and goes on with his life like nothing ever happened. No, it didn't go that way. He digs up a treasure when no one is looking, and he steals it, hoping that no one will catch him. No, it didn't go that way either. Instead, he knows the rules of engagement. He knows that the treasure is the property of whoever owns the field. So therefore, it's nothing he can come in and just snatch. It's something that he has to buy the dirt in order to get what's under the dirt. That's the way it goes. And here's the thing that I really want you to see. When he notices this, it's like the best day of his life. He's just stumbled onto the opportunity of a lifetime. I can't believe this happened to me. So in light of that, he goes home, and once he tells his parents about this, they force him to sell everything he has, so he has to go buy the field. No, that didn't happen. A lot of things that didn't happen today. Or it's this idea of, hey, you know what? I, I found this field, this treasure in this field is really valuable, but I'm kind of bummed about all the things I'm going to have to say goodbye to. I've got to sell all my stuff in order to buy the field. That's really going to come at a high cost. I'm really going to miss this one particular, no, none of that, with joy. That's what I want you to catch today, with joy. He can't believe this is actually happening. He is ecstatic. In his soul, he was doing cartwheels all the way to go and purchase the deed. And once he did and bought it, he was physically doing cartwheels all the way home. I cannot believe this happened to me. I cannot believe, though what it cost me everything, it is so absolutely worth it. That's what I want you to see today that I think often gets missed. He was stoked. He was so excited that this happened to him. One commentator wrote that buying the field was the surest way of making his possession absolutely secure. That's what it would cost. It cost him not a little. It cost him everything. But it didn't matter because of what he was gaining was so much better. I want you to see that in order that he did this in all the right ways, he didn't steal, he didn't purchase the field in some sort of backhanded way. Everything he did was according to the rules of engagement. But it's the joy part. That's the part I really don't want you to miss today. I feel like we're very quick when we talk about this particular passage to amplify how much it costs us to follow Jesus. And we should because this passage says he sold everything in order to do so. Never want to minimize that, but I think sometimes I've even preached this passage only through that lens of what it costs, what I give up, and I'm failing to see what I get. I'm failing to see the treasure that I have found, that I've stumbled upon, that is now worth so much. It's not a begrudging thing. It's not a thing under compulsion. In joy, we sell all we have in order so we can grab onto this. That's what I want you to see in this story. When you process this, some of you realize today this is actually your story. You weren't really looking for Jesus. You were kind of going through life and relatively content, but, but something happened. You stumbled upon his truth. 
And when you did, you would never really could be the same because you realized I had such a kind of looking down at my feet perspective of life. I never really raised my gaze to understand that there is a God. I never knew I was in a wrong relationship with him simply by being born with a sinful nature and then evidencing it with sinful behaviors. And now all of a sudden I've realized that this great God has done something for me that I would have never expected. He sent his one and only son who came and lived a sinless life, who died a sacrificial death, who was raised supernaturally on the third day. He did all of those things so I could be right with him and that I could know him and live with him forever in eternity. And once you came across that reality, though you hadn't been looking for Jesus, guaranteed he was looking for you. And when you stumbled upon him, you gladly, it wasn't even like a, a hard sell or, or some big, all this kind of, comp, you're like, I'm in. Everything over here, Jesus first and Jesus alone. It's awesome when you read this parable having lived that life and realize, man, I can totally relate to this because that's what it was like for me. That's when I came and I understood what really was, it was all about. I love this quote from John MacArthur. Look up on the screen or in your notes. Seen through the eyes of this world, it is as high a price as anyone can pay. But from a kingdom perspective, it's really no sacrifice at all. I've had that quote in my Bible since I was in college, and I love it because it just reminds me at the times when I think that I've, quote, sacrificed in order to follow Jesus, it far outweighs who Jesus is and what he's done for me and how great it is to be his. So absolutely worth it. Jesus mentions another kind of treasure finder, one who is actually a treasure seeker. This is different, the second parable, different than the first. It was a merchant who was looking for a prized pearl, and when he finds it, he leverages everything he has in order to buy it. The word translated in verse 45, looking, means to seek by inquiring, to investigate, to reach a binding or terminal resolution, meaning he was going everywhere he knew, talking to different people, talking to different fishermen, talking to merchants to try to find this pearl. And once he found it, he leveraged everything to get it. The reaction to this find, though also with great intentionality, very different than the first case, he responds in the very same way. Everything so I can purchase that. For some of you here today, that's your story. Your story is a little bit more like his. In that, you had this sense Talking about living with your eyes on the ground, your eyes were up, you just didn't know where to look. You might have actually looked in lots of types of things, even lots of different religious systems, realizing as you walked it out, this isn't it though. They're pointing me towards something, but this, isn't, this, it, this can't be true. It doesn't make sense, it's not really what I understand to be reality. And you kept looking and you kept asking questions. And then you came upon Jesus. And when you did, it wasn't easy at first. It wasn't like this simple, I'm in. It was like, you know what? I got some questions for you. And you might have even felt like you were pestering the Christians in your world that you were asking questions of. I guarantee they never felt like that. They love talking about this Jesus that they love so much. And you asked a lot of questions and you went to a lot of church services or seminars. Or you talked to people. You wanted all the evidence you can get. And once you realize this is the pearl that I've been looking for. You finally realize I'm setting everything aside, I'm in. I love these two stories because though they have different approaches of how they find these treasures, they ultimately respond the same way because that's what following Jesus demands. Setting aside, we'll see some more of that today, but setting aside everything I know in order to make him first. Now, these parables, by the way, to me, are kind of the stuff of Hollywood, meaning we have movies that actually have these same themes of someone who'd be willing to go after this incredible treasure at the risk of their own life or reputation to do so. Just a few weeks ago, my family rewatched National Treasure, and you remember that movie, and it was all about that idea of going, you know what, his family's name's been besmirched, and this whole thing, he's going to risk his life to prove this, and he goes after this treasure. And if you grew up in the 80s like me, there's no better story than Indiana Jones. And the great thing about Indy is this, is that I loved it. It was never so he could have the treasure. It was always what? This belongs in a museum, right? So it needs to be in the right hands in the right way that people can appreciate it. But it was that same thing. I'm going to risk life and limb in order to get this treasure of great value. Even when you think about maybe not treasure, but the idea of these great stories of getting the girl. 
I love, it's though, though it's not to the same degree as the parables Jesus was sharing, it made me think this week of the gift of the Magi. If you've ever heard that short story, it's been turned into a play as well. And, it, and it, what it is is a couple leveraging things that matter the world to them in order to, to serve and to love each other. So we see these stories, they're all throughout our culture and they're very powerful, but this is what we're talking about today. In your notes, simple question for you, is there anything that has so much value to you that you've been willing to invest everything to have it? Simple question about where you are, where you sit today, this stage of life, where you're at on the journey. Is there anything that has had so much value that like these two in these, in these parables today, you've been willing to risk and invest everything in order to achieve it? Now, our high school students just got back from a great week of camp. Not only did they have a blast, but God was at work. Students gave their life to the Lord. Others recommitted their lives. Our middle school students leave this week, and we're praying the same thing for God to work in their lives. The interesting thing is, and I remember thinking about this when I transitioned out of youth ministry to work more with adults, I think sometimes as we get excited about what God's doing in young lives, there is a part of us that kind of goes, yeah, but that's easier to respond to Jesus when you have less on the line. In my 30s, I've got a young family to care for. In my 40s, I have a career to think about. <clears throat> In my 60s, I have retirement to enjoy. These are big things, and to set those things aside so that I can make Jesus number one, uh, there's, there's more to the story. Some of you, the reason why you're not willing to do that is simply because you have been burned before. You did respond to that email. <laughs> You've been scammed, and that's your impression. This old Jesus thing, <clears throat> I wouldn't mind being religious, but I'm not going that far. To make him number one, man, I've been burned before. Some of us just think sensibly. It's not good to put all your eggs in one basket. Maybe move out there a little bit, check things out, but don't go too far, don't be extreme. Like you're maybe thinking of that person that invited you today, they're kind of wacky. <laughs> don't be extreme because man, if that goes south, everything goes with it. And maybe you've had that happen to you before. Maybe you've had investments or things that have gone south. You put all the eggs in one basket and you have nothing to show for it. Can I tell you this today? That's not the Jesus that we're talking about. He's unlike all those things you'd compare him to. And rather than you hear me try to defend that, let me just show you what the Bible says. That's our best way to do it. Let's, um, let's see this. I, I know, last point and then we'll get to our next point. Here's the thing I really find wildly refreshing today. And this is our next thing I wanna show you. Jesus does expect you to invest all of you to follow him, but he doesn't ask you to blindly invest without first considering the cost as well as a reward. Number two in your notes, Jesus doesn't expect you to follow him without first considering the cost. I really find great pleasure in this that even though we saw that first part, right? Like, wow, these guys were nuts. They just sold everything and went after it. Jesus says, yes, they did and they should because they understood what they were getting. They understood the treasure or the pearl that they were searching after. They knew its value. Jesus says, in that case, it makes all the sense. Today, for you, if you're going, I'm not sure of the value, let's see what Jesus has to say on it. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay a foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. When he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose one coming against him with 20,000. If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. Watch this. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Wow. That's powerful. We were talking very theoretically, kind of like this really cute illustration a minute ago. A guy stumbles onto a treasure. Another guy was desperately seeking it. They sold everything to go get it. Now we're talking about, whoa, Jesus is talking about hating people. Like, where did we jump to all of a sudden? Well, let's back it up. Let's look at a couple things. Contextually, 
We've, if that's not been a theme for you this summer, it sure has been for me. Every one of these parables is couched in a unique context, and Jesus, the master of understanding his audience, knows who to say what to. And you'll notice at the beginning of where we were in Luke chapter 14, it says this, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Jesus was incredibly popular at this point of his ministry, and there were people who were incredibly interested. I call them groupies. There's this rabbi, no one knows, from Nazareth, and he's saying wild things, and he's doing amazing things. I mean, he does stuff that no prophet's ever done. I want to go check that out. And that might have even been part of your story, that as you maybe were invited by a friend to some sort of event or a concert, or, or even came on a Sunday morning and, and started realizing, well, I'm just going to go check this thing out. I'm not ready to commit by any means, but I'm just going to see. I think that's how all of us have some sort of introduction to who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. That's true, but the difference is, is now when Jesus says these words, this is where groupies get off the bus. Like, hey, <laughs> that is way more commitment than I was expecting, that guy's nuts. And that's exactly what would happen after this story or after this narrative, as does other times in the gospels, because why? Jesus wasn't looking to be popular. Jesus was God himself. No need to be popular. What Jesus was looking for were people who were willing to say, like we've seen all throughout this, these passages today, Jesus, you're worth more than anything I could stack up next to you, I'm in. Look at a little bit more as we kind of see this. You probably bristled a bit when you heard the phrase, whoever does not hate father or mother, wife or children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Let me help you a little bit with that. Look in your notes. The Greek word here translated as hate can mean that of strong distaste or full rejection. There are places in the New Testament where that word's used that way. But it's really, it's a word of comparison that many commentators see better understood as to renounce one choice in favor of another. To renounce one choice in favor of another. This is the way I see it. It seems incredibly inconsistent for the same Jesus to say, you are called to love your neighbor as yourself. You're called to love your enemy when they treat you as such. Then to say, but by the way, hate your parents. I mean, that just like, wait a second, for us to understand that, that doesn't make any sense. So think of it this way, let's, let's put that word back in. If you're going to follow me, you need to love me more, prefer me more, renounce the hold that these others have on your life, that I might be first. Now, if that was any person calling you to that, you'd probably want to run for the hills. But Jesus was the son of God. And so God himself calling you into relationship to know him, to follow him, to love him. God himself demonstrating to you what it means to be loved by the creator of the universe. What it means to be forgiven. Like we saw last week, a debt you could never repay. What it means to know purpose for why you're on the planet. What it means to have the hope, the confidence that you'll be with Jesus forever when you follow him in this life now. And that is absolutely worth changing. Absolutely worth setting aside so he can be first. So that's what that phrase is really more about. This idea that it is a decision, it is a choice to put his will, his ways, his calling above the wishes of yourself or anyone else. The phrase you maybe have heard before, he is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. That's reminiscent of this passage and what it's talking about. And again, I think that listeners might have been stunned to hear these words of such strong commitment. But again, in light of what Jesus is offering, he's inviting them into, preferring him to all others is not only not too much to ask, but go back to what we said before. For those who really understand who Jesus is and what he's inviting them into, for joy, they set aside those relationships so Jesus can be prime. You probably thought less about the phrase, whoever does not carry their cross and does not follow me cannot be my disciple, because we've kind of spiritualized that term, and we'll say things like, oh, it's my cross to bear, like it's a challenge you're going through. I guarantee you, people in the first century did not miss what Jesus said. They're, they're in my spirit, knowing the way that Jesus taught, it could have been without any uniqueness, that they weren't far from where someone had just been crucified. 
Do not miss what he was saying. Unless you value me even over your own life, you can't follow me. No one missed it. Total commitment is what they heard. Now, for you and I in 2019 in Southern California, I just will tell you those words are words that we don't often interact with to, to know really experientially what they mean. It's, it's right to say, Jesus, I do put you first over anyone and anything, including my own will, my claim on my life. But I will tell you, our brothers and sisters around the world who are being persecuted for their faith, this is a very real thing. That's why when our staff gathers, there'll be times when we pray for the persecuted church. And interestingly enough, they're not only persecuted by maybe governmental systems, they're often persecuted from their own family members. If you follow Jesus, you're dead to me. That's the kind of thing that people have said. And that's when we look at this passage, we go, experientially, that's what it might mean. Jesus, you first. Over everything else, you're worth it, and I put you first. And why? I don't put you first begrudgingly. I don't put you first under compulsion. I put you first because of joy, because of the joy that has afforded me to know you and to know you forever. That's what these passages are about today. Look how he states it. He says, he goes on to give some ex examples of the way you invest. He says, I want you to think about this. Remember, you have looky-loos, you have the, the, the groupies who are just checking Jesus out. He's like, hey, you gotta, you gotta love me more than anything. Let me give you an illustration. Again, another parable they could understand. And he talks about how you wouldn't build a tower or a king wouldn't march out to war without first considering the cost, without first understanding if he could win the battle. The idea is that you wouldn't do that. Think of it this way. You've heard this phrase, you don't shoot first and then aim later. Okay, you, you take it as one piece. My brother-in-law will often say that you can measure once and cut twice or measure twice and cut once. Interestingly enough, I'm really wired the other way. <laughs> I'm a lot more like, let's build it in the air. Let's just see how it goes. And that can get you in trouble. And it's done plenty. The way that it works in my house with my wife, uh, we just moved uh, a few weeks ago and we're hanging stuff up on the walls. Todd's approach to hanging things on the wall is kind of like, yep, nail, walk away. It's staying up there, it's good, right? That's a win, right? Joanna, when she looks at things, she's like, we have a laser level for a reason. Get it out. And between that and our cool little bubble one, and, and by the way, the bubble level has a, two sets of lines. I feel like if any part of the bubble is touching one of those lines, it should count. Joanna, dead center, not touching any lines, right in the middle. So we're constantly doing this whole thing. I have, you'd be proud of me in this last move, I have acquiesced, because her way is way better. I totally admit that. Mine is more out of, I have better things to do, but hers, her way has always been better. And it was amazing of being able to say, you know what, we'll take as long as it takes. Doot, doot, doot. We'll pull back, no, nope, let's remeasure it. And I'll, I'll tell you, stuff on our wall not only is staying there, it looks great. The problem is, with most of our lives, hanging things on walls are one thing, but how we do life, we're often measuring once and cutting twice. We're often just kind of looks good and back away, throw it up on the wall and see, and, and we're really not taking into account things that really matter and things that really last. That's what I absolutely love. If you have ever heard that being a Christian is for a group of people who have not thought through, how are just simply emotive and just kind of get goosebumps and respond. That's not the Christianity that the Bible at all calls us to. So if you have that impression, you've, you've missed something, at least on what Jesus has taught. I'm not saying there aren't Christians who might appear that way, but I surely know that's not the calling that Jesus has. And I love this, that Jesus says, if you're gonna follow me, it's not gonna be some blind, purely emotive response, but a faith that has done the math, a faith that has considered the cost and realized that what you're getting is still the opportunity of a lifetime. Though it seems you're giving away so much, and by the way, for many of us, it seemed that way initially, that seems a lot less like that today. Jesus, it is so good to know you, to be loved by you. If you're here today and you're considering the choice of following Jesus against what it will cost you, you're here and evaluating, I'd encourage you to do this. Don't trust me. I'd encourage you to ask someone. 
Ask someone that you know is following Jesus and ask them this simple question, is it worth it? If you want to know, and you're like, I don't even know this guy up on stage, I don't know what I think about the Bible, okay, ask the person who brought you, is this worth it? And I know the people of Trinity Church. What they won't tell you is, yes, because it's so comfortable. Yes, because I don't have any problems anymore. That's bunk. That's not true at all. And by the way, Jesus never promised that. But what they will tell you, when I understand how much the creator of the universe loves me, and has not just sent Jesus to make me right, but adopted me into his family, yeah, yeah, it's worth it each and every day. For some of us, that's the real test, is knowing if it works. If you're here today and you have made a decision to invest yourself in following Jesus, and you would say, yeah, Todd, I made that decision. I'm so glad. Look in your notes. As the people in your relational worlds watch you live like Jesus really is the found treasure, they will notice that you haven't just added him. You haven't just added him to your agendas or your life, but that you truly are his follower who values him above everything else. See, when you live out this, what we've talked about today, remember, don't equate joy with happiness. I'm really excited in the fall, we're taking on a series that's gonna be all about joy. We're gonna define it really well. But joy, truly an inner sense of just gratitude, an inner sense of just being able to represent what is true about who God is and how it interacts with your life, that kind of joy when, when you live that out, the people in your world, they notice it because of the things you say. They notice it because of the things that you do. They notice it because of the way you love them. They will know. They'll know that Jesus is the treasure, not just an add-on. Finally today, number three, when you know how it all ends, investing yourself in Jesus makes more sense than any other option. We know how it all ends. Investing yourself in Jesus makes more sense than any other option. Some of you read that and you're like, What? Like, really, Todd? That, that's, the, that's the big pitch today? You know, it's just, it's the most sensible thing to do. Well, let me say this. For some of us who would say, hey, everything about our appeal to Jesus is always out of his love for us and our love for him. And I would say that's true, but it's interesting. All the parables we looked at today have actually been about, have you done the math? Have you thought this through? Have you recognized that what is to gain is so much more worth what you think you're giving up? So these parables are actually less about this kind of out of a welling up of love response and more about, hey, think about it and still see that it's sound, still see that it's right. Look at this last phrase and I'll explain what I'm talking about. Uh, Mark chapter 16, this is what Jesus says. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Simple statement, Jesus helps you do the math. Here's what Jesus knows that we don't. We think that our stuff, our lives, our accomplishments, our relationships, our ambitions, we think they're ours. Jesus knows better you're gonna die and you're gonna be separated from all of those things. And the true you, the real you, is all that's gonna be left. And apart from a right relationship with God, that true you is gonna be separated from God forever. Jesus knows better, he knows how it ends. And so he's telling this to the people who are listening, who think that their stuff is theirs. Every time I do, no, every time, most times I do a memorial service, I always include that 10 out of 10 people die. It is going to happen to you. And the simple reality is, is are you doing the math? Are you understanding that all those things are set aside when you move beyond death? And the reality is what Jesus wants you to understand is that the real you is what goes on, all those things you lose. If whoever wants to hold on to their life, they don't understand, they actually lose it. But for the one who wants to find their life, eternal life, that's when they let go of their life now. It's a simple equation. Are you gonna let it go now volitionally or another day is it gonna be taken from you? I love this line. It's, it's these profound words from Jim Elliott service well today. He is no fool who gives up what he can't keep to gain that which he can't lose. 
profound, simple, and so just right to the heart. This is the decision to follow Jesus, and it is not a foolish one. I really appreciated in our afterlife, after this life series that we just got done, we learned some really powerful things about eternity. One of those things, I was entering this week, I was finally able to finish a commitment I made when I came to Trinity Church, and that was that I passed my oral examination for my ordination with Evangelical Free Church of America. So I'm grateful to, thank you. It's been a long process. The elders have been incredibly patient all the way through, but we got that done on Thursday. And it was interesting. One of the questions that was asked to me during the day was a question we grappled with during that After This Life series, and that was this. The fairness of a life lived, let's say, completely apart from God here, but it's very temporary. Is it fair that that gets the consequence of eternal separation from God, a temporary action with an eternal consequence? And I remember being able to share with the council that we had actually grappled with that question in our series recently, among other things. And within it, though, what was interesting, and we talked about the idea that, number one, if anything else, it bubbles to the top how incredibly important your short life on this planet is, because it does have eternal ramifications. But I said, isn't it interesting that we ask the fair question related to hell, but we never ask the fair question related to heaven? And here's what I mean by that. A life here, yours and mine, that's lived following Jesus. You missed it at the very end of what we read. And the Son of Man will come back with the glory of the Father and his angels, and he'll reward. He'll reward those who have set down their lives to follow me. How is it fair that living for Jesus in this life is going to experience eternal reward? Right? We always think fair to the negative. We never think it fair to the positive. And it's incredibly unfair, but incredibly in the heart of God. That's what is going to happen. And that's what I would say to you today, to live a life that matters now that God will reward forever versus living a life that you think you can hold on to, but is going to be taken from you. Here's our now what statement that we begin with today. It's on the screens in your notes. Experience the joy that is yours when you invest yourself fully into Jesus and his promises. Let me pray. Father, we're so very grateful for who you are, very grateful that it's not fair, that you don't give us what we deserve. We talked about that last week, mercy, that you are a merciful God. I'm grateful, too, that you give us what we don't deserve. You're a gracious God. Both of these things, two sides of the same coin, they're part of your nature and your way, and we're so grateful that you have made known Jesus to us. And the goal of being made known to us is that we would respond. And I pray, Father, this week, would we respond out of joy, out of a deep gratitude of what you have done on our behalf so that we could be right with you, so that we could live with you forever. Help us invest our lives according to what we've seen in Scripture today. Nobody comes before you. No thing comes before you. I don't come. My claim on my life doesn't come before you and what you want from me. God, would we as a church have that kind of voice in the way we live this week? You may be here and you have realized this is something I have never responded to. I've never said, yes, Jesus, I'm willing to put you first in my life, ready to set everyone and everything else to the side because you are worth it. You are the treasure, you are the pearl, and I'm in. And if you're ready to make that decision today, it begins by A, admitting that you're a a sinner who needs a savior. B, believing that Jesus is the only savior available. And C, choosing, choosing to put your trust, your confidence, not in yourself, hoping that the scale maybe is more good than bad. The Bible says that's never gonna happen. But instead, to put your confidence and trust in what Jesus has accomplished for you and living out of that identity, out of that truth, a life that honors him. Father, would we be a people this week who demonstrate we haven't just added you to our lives, but you really are the treasure. We want everyone to know. We love you and we pray in Jesus' great name. Amen.